A lot of us love crime shows. Shows like NCIS, Monk, Blue Bloods, Psych, CSI, Magnum PI, Knight Rider, just to name a few of those. We love to see how they would investigate crimes, look for evidence, see who might have a motive that committed the crime, see how maybe they try to use DNA evidence to figure out who's guilty or what criminal might have left some clues along that helps them find out who's guilty. But part of those crime shows that often gets left out is the importance of a witness. And the witness is someone that saw something happen and is able to appear in court before a judge and a jury and give their testimony about what they saw happen that hopefully leads the defendant to a guilty verdict. And these shows often end before we get to the court, right? We kind of see the bad guy thrown into handcuffs and hauled off to jail and the episode ends. But usually, in order to get a guilty verdict, there has to be that courtroom scene with the witness that shares their testimony. And in our passage today that Kendra read, Jesus brings forth some witnesses to support his case. And he does that because the Jews were beginning to persecute Jesus because he had claimed that he was God. And there's a change of focus here in the Gospel of John as we've been going through it, uh, starting in chapter 1. Those first four chapters were different presentations of Jesus as the Son of God. We saw a presentation from John the Baptist that Jesus is God, then John's disciples, then this guy named Nicodemus tells us that Jesus is God, then this woman at the Samaritan well presents to us how Jesus is God. And starting with chapter 5, we see a change occur. No longer are we seeing these presentations of Jesus as God, but now we're seeing confrontations with Jesus among the Jews. And that's the context here. At the beginning of chapter 5, Jesus has healed that paralyzed man that was sitting near the well near Jerusalem. And that man grabs his mat and starts to walk. And he has this conflict with the Jews because the Jews see the man carrying his mat on the Sabbath and they hear that Jesus has healed him on the Sabbath. And Jesus responds to those Jews with a big long speech that starts in verse 19 and continues through verse 47. And the first half of that speech is what we saw last week where Jesus claimed to be equal with God, how he was the second member of the Trinity. And this week, we're looking at the second half of that speech, where Jesus brings forth five different witnesses to support his claim that he is God in the flesh in front of them. So if you have the sermon outline there, there's really just two sections we're going to look at. An opening statement from Jesus in verse 31, and then witness testimonies from five different witnesses, starting in verse 32, going through verse 37. So let's look at his opening statement in verse 31, where Jesus says, If I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. This is Jesus' admission that a skeptical person might not be convinced that someone saying something about himself is authentic. And in the Jewish law, Deuteronomy 19 said that you couldn't be a witness at your own testimony or at your own um, trial. And then in Deuteronomy 17, it said you had to have two or three witnesses. So Jesus is kind of admitting to their own argument that the Jews might ask of him. So next, let's look at these five witnesses that Jesus calls up to verify that he is the Son of God. And you all know that I, I like good, bad jokes. Or do we call them bad, good jokes? So I got two attorney jokes for you as we're talking about this courtroom scene. What does a lawyer wear to the courthouse? A lawsuit? Okay. What drinks are served in the courthouse? What drinks are served in courthouses? Subpoena coladas. So, there we go. All right, those are your two, your two jokes for you. So next, let's look at these five witness testimonies. And Jesus starts by sharing the witness of the Father in verse 32, 37, and 38. 
where it says, There is another, Jesus says, There is another who testifies of me, and I know that the testimony which he gives about me is true. You have sent John, and he has testified the truth. Then down to verse 37. And the Father who sent me, he has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his form. You do not have his word abiding in your heart, for you do not believe him whom he sent. Now we see the, the verb testify and the noun testimony 11 times in this passage. And here it describes the continual witness of the Father. This is a witness that the Father began at some point in the past, and it still continues at this point to them. And it's a testimony probably about the Father's work where he impresses on people's conscience that Jesus is God and that Jesus brings truth. But these Jewish leaders didn't recognize Jesus as God's son. They'd been studying the law and teaching it daily, but they failed to believe God when they now saw God in front of them. As in verse 38 says, you do not have his word abiding in you. And God had sent his word to these people in the past. For 700 years, God had sent prophets to try to tell them about the Messiah. 700 years before those prophets, he sent Moses to set up the law that would point to Christ. And 700 years before Moses, he gave a word to Abraham saying, through Abraham, through your seed, all the nations of the world would be blessed. So we learn that the father is a witness. But wait, these Jews have a witness they've already seen and talked to. And that's the second witness that Jesus presents to them, John the Baptist. And we read about the ministry of John the Baptist in verse 33, where it says, Jesus says, you have sent to John and he has testified to the truth. And Jesus confronts the Jews directly here by starting off that sentence saying, you, kind of almost pointing the finger at them, you Jews have sent to John. You have sent people to talk to John. And when he talks about that, it references in chapter 1 how the Jewish Sanhedrin court had sent representatives to John to ask John, who are you? Are you the Messiah? What are you doing? They actually sent a different couple groups of people to ask John who he was. But John's ministry had been very clear. He was saying that Jesus was the Lord, that Jesus was the Lamb of God, and that Jesus was the Son of God. John's ministry was to get people ready so that when the Messiah arrived, they could be ready to follow the Messiah. And Jesus describes for us the purpose of John the Baptist in verse 34. It says, but the testimony which I receive is not from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. Jesus brings up the testimony of John the Baptist saying that purpose so that you may be saved. It's what's called a purpose conjunction in Greek with the word henna tells us the purpose or the goal or the aim of an action. Usually you can translate it as so that in order that with the goal that and the purpose here shows that Jesus is talking about John so that these guys would get saved. And it's a reminder to us that our actions as believers today should be intentional to get others saved as well. Everything we say and everything we do should be towards the goal of getting others saved. When you go to the grocery store once or twice a week and you meet the same you know, clerks that check you out and you sometimes you develop a relationship, try to find one that's not a Christian and go to him or her. Ask her how she's doing and if she's having a rough day. Maybe you say, can I pray with you for eight seconds real quick to help you get through your day? Maybe you have a friend that's in the hospital and you're busy, you don't have any time, but you still make time to go see your friend in the hospital and spend 40 minutes talking with him, praying with him, Maybe you go to the cafeteria and you sneak him a Dr. Pepper or something to, to help him and cheer, cheer up his thoughts. Now, those aren't things that are probably going to get someone saved right there on the spot. But maybe 20 years from now, that grocery clerk will remember that she had told lots of people she was having bad days in the past. Half of them just said, oh, that's great, and moved on, didn't even listen to her. But she remembered that one Christian lady that listened to her 
and prayed for her and helped her get through the day. Or maybe your friend that spent a week in the hospital trying to pass that kidney stone and nobody else came to see him except for his wife and you. And you were the one friend that came and talked to him and prayed with him. People remember those things. As we go about our life, we need to be intentional that our actions will lead other people to get saved. So Jesus has described the ministry of John the Baptist, the purpose of John the Baptist. Then in verse 35, he describes the sacrifice of John the Baptist. He says, John the Baptist, he was the lamp that was burning and was shining. And you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. Now notice how it says John the Baptist was a lamp and he was burning and he was shining, all past tense. And Jesus says that because at this point in time, John the Baptist had already been put in prison and probably had already been killed. He suffered and died because of his faith in God and because he called out the sin of Herod Antipas and Herod's friend, Herodias. Because Herod Antipas was a pretty bad and evil, wicked guy, and John the Baptist would call out his sin and describe it as evil and wicked. And then when Herod Antipas takes Herodias, his brother's wife, John the Baptist also speaks out about how that was not right either. And John the Baptist ends up being killed because of what he says and because of his witness. He died in prison all alone. The Bible doesn't tell us anyone was there with him. Nobody tried to rescue him. He died because of his faith and because of his preaching about Jesus. And it's a good reminder for us. Our witness of God is often a cost to ourselves. When we place faith in God and follow him obediently, it affects our lives. Sometimes there are sacrifices and a cost because of us placing our faith in Christ. There's some people, they want to pursue a lifestyle where they get to enjoy the nicest house and the newest car and the coolest toys and the most extravagant vacations. And because of that, they spend every penny they earn plus some, right? That's kind of what some people choose to do. But us, because we're believers, we're taught that everything we are given is God's gift, that everything we have, he already owns. And because of that, we give back to God in a tithe, and we support international missionaries around the world, or we support local nonprofits and things like that. Because of that, we try to spend less than we earn and manage our money, and that's a sacrifice, that's a cost. That means when you're a young couple and you got three kids and you want to take a vacation, you don't go to... Europe or some place really nice, you end up going to Eastern Washington, okay? <laughs> you knew where I was going before I got there. <laughs> yep. Not that it's not a nice place, but you just, you go to Eastern Washington, you stay with friends so that you don't have to pay a hotel room because you're trying to do what God has called you to do, to live faithfully and obediently and use the resources he gives you wisely. Not to say going to Europe is bad. If you can afford those things, go for it. But at certain, at certain points in life, we just need to manage our finances carefully, and that's a cost to us. Some of us might have jobs where we work with supervisors that are willing to do whatever it takes to keep production numbers up or sales numbers up, and because of that, they'll bend the rules, cut corners, and sometimes even break the law to keep those numbers high where they want them to be. And us as believers that want to have a conscience and do things right and be morally correct, sometimes that means we have to speak out and disagree. Sometimes that means we might not get a good performance review. We might not get a promotion when it comes. We might even lose our job because we speak out about things that are being done illegally. Our witness of God is often a cost to ourselves. So we've seen these first two witnesses Jesus calls forth, but, w but wait, he's got a third one he's about to present. And it's the miracles that Jesus does. In verse 36, Jesus describes his miracles saying, but the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John for the works which the father has given me to accomplish, the works that I do testify about me that the Father 
has sent me. So while John the Baptist was great, he didn't do miracles like Jesus did. As good as John the Baptist's witnesses was, Jesus has a superior testimony. And in this, this book, the Gospel of John, there are seven different miracles or signs that Jesus does that tell us that he is God. We've seen three of those thus far, that he turns water into wine at that wedding, that he heals that boy that had a fever and was about to die, and that he healed that man that had been paralyzed for 38 years sitting at the pool near Jerusalem. And picture this, one of those miracles was literally standing right in front of these Jews. That man that had his mat that he was picking up and carrying around probably didn't put that thing down for a week, I bet. I bet he didn't sit down for a week or lay down, or a day, maybe not a week, but a day. And he's walking around. These guys, these Jews probably saw that guy standing in front of them. They might even have known him or had names that they called him because he'd been there for 38 years. I wonder if they had names for him like Crippled Caleb, Disabled Don, Isaac the Immovable, Lame Paul, Lame Luke or Paralyzed Paul. You know, maybe they had names for this poor guy and he's sitting there, standing there right in front of them. That's one of the witnesses that Jesus presents to them. It's the miracles that he had done. J. Vernon McGee says about this verse, the credentials that Jesus had were the miracles that Jesus performed. But wait, Jesus doesn't just have three witnesses. He has a fourth that he shares next. And that's the scriptures. Those are the scriptures, verse 39 through 40. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. And you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. I do not receive glory from men, but I do know that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? See, the Jewish leaders, they highly revered God's word. They regularly read it and they studied the Old Testament, and we should give them credit for that. They were diligent in trying to know God. But as Warren Wearsby says, he says, the Jewish scribes sought to know the word of God, but they failed to recognize the God of the Word when he appeared. They missed Jesus when he showed up right in front of them. And this is a gentle reminder for us that our study of Scripture should lead to actions, not just knowledge. Our study of God leads to actions, not just knowledge. Spiritual maturity is not defined by our knowledge of God, but by our actions and what we do in our behavior. On Wednesday nights, we've been doing a discipleship group here at church and where we do topical studies in scripture. And then we, after we study the topic, we kind of move to how do we apply this to our lives? And there's always a third step. I kind of don't always do a good job of taking us to, but how have we applied what we said we were going to do to our lives? And what does that look like? Because Bible sh study should lead us to a big heart, not a big head. And as believers, our spiritual maturity is not measured by the amount of knowledge we have in our head, but it's measured by the size of our hearts for other people. The knowledge of God's word should not puff us up, but should build us up in love of one another. Now in verse 41 is the shortest little verse in this passage, seven words that it's easy just to cruise through and miss. Verse 41 says, I do not receive glory from men. That's what Jesus says. I do not receive glory from men. Christ didn't receive praise from humans. He sought fellowship with God. And for us, that's a reminder for us that our praise comes from God, not from other human 
beings. And this is a tough one for us because we want to be liked, we want people to accept us, we want to be part of the group and be included. Most of us feel that pressure even as adults. And I remember feeling this pressure when I was in high school, just to give you a little feel for my story. I went to public school from kindergarten to third grade, and then from fourth grade to eighth grade I was homeschooled, and then ninth grade to twelfth grade I went back to public school. And I remember in high school, the thought that was always going through my mind every day, what can I say to get people to like me? Or what can I do to get people to like me? Two questions that usually didn't give good answers for a high school student, right? But that's the, the pressure that we, we feel. We want to be accepted and liked by other people. But as believers, we should be the most self-confident people on the earth. We should be confident in our identity regardless of what other people think about us. Because we are known by God that he knew us before we were born. I'm going to read a few passages to you. You're welcome to just listen to them because I have them marked in my Bible. Psalm 139 talks about how God knew us before we were born. Psalm 139, verse 13 through 17. David says, You formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen me unformed, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me. When as yet there was not one of them, how precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. We're known by God before we were even born. He knew us and had a plan for us. In addition to that, we also have been made in God's image. Genesis 1, 26 and 27 tell us, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and all the birds of the sky and over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. We're known by God. We were created in God's image. And God made us like him to represent him, just as Psalm 8, 3 through 6 says. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him? and the son of man that you care for him. Yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. You make him rule over all the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. We shouldn't look to other people to give us value because God gives us our value. He knew us before we were born, were made in his image, and he made us to rule and reign with him. And this means for us that we don't get our value or our self-worth from our job that we do during the day, from the school that we graduated from, from our role as a mother, father, or grandparent, from our outward looks, outward looks how few wrinkles we have, or how big our muscles might be, what our GPA is. We don't get our value from those things. We get them from God. And those are all good things to work towards, and those are okay, but we can't tie up our value in those things, because if we do, life is going to be a long, disappointing journey. So Jesus has presented four witnesses, but wait, he's got one more, last one, and it's this guy named Moses in verses 45 through 47. Jesus says, Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So this fifth witness is kind of similar to the fourth, 
the scriptures. Moses was the guy that wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, what's called the Torah or the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And while Jews, of course, studied the 39 books of the Old Testament, they always gave a little extra emphasis to those five books, the Torah written by Moses, because it contained that revered law written by the respected guy, Moses. And Jesus presents here Moses because Moses told the people that there would be a prophet that rises up after him that would be greater than Moses that they should recognize. And that's Jesus that's right there in front of them. So I want to end our time together by asking you a question. Who are your witnesses? If someone asked you, why do you believe Jesus is God, what would be a few witnesses you call up to help defend your statement? Here in this passage, Jesus was ready. He pulls five right up in front of them. He talks about the Father. He talks about Moses. He talks about the scriptures. He talks about John the Baptist and his own miracles. If you're fortunate to have someone ask you, why do you believe Jesus is God? A sincere, genuine interest. I hope this week you can think about and pray about what would be a witness or two I present to them. Maybe some things based on scripture or maybe some experiences you've been through that leads you to believe Jesus is God. Who would be those witnesses that you call to the stand to support the verdict you hope that they make about Jesus. Let's pray. God, thank you for our time here together. Thank you for the freedom we have to open your word, to read it and study and talk about what it means for us and how we follow you together as a family. I pray for those of us maybe that don't know God, we're seeking and we want to learn about him. Maybe we don't believe that Jesus was God. I pray that you would work in those people's hearts and draw them to you. And I know everybody here has some people in their life that doesn't follow you, family members and friends, that they hope will place their faith in you. I pray you would help those people this week to discover what are some witnesses they can call to the stand to share a testimony about you, to point others to faith in you. And these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So I'll invite you to stand if you are able, and I'll read to us a benediction, and you'll be dismissed, and it'll be time for potluck. So. Dismiss us now, O Lord, in your name. Send us forth in your strength. Keep us in your care. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.